Thank you guys very much for coming today. Um, we're going to be talking about water smart landscaping, right? Come to the right class. Um, what water smart landscaping involves, the main thing is building healthy soil, try to protect lakes from runoff, and to encourage roots to grow into the ground, just really soaking in, being able to soak in water, using water wisely to maximize infiltration and plant health, and uh, selecting the proper plants. So, <coughs> excuse me, background on myself. Um, I'm a Bloomington resident. I've lived here for 15 years, um, but I've worked in natural resources management, or my background is in landscape architecture. I'm from South Dakota. Grew up on a farm, and I graduated from South Dakota State University in 94 in their landscape architecture program. I moved to the Twin Cities in the mid-90s then and did residential landscaping. I did that for a while, and we worked on a lot of new construction projects. A lot of, we worked with developers and home builders, and it, you know, it's, it's all going all crazy there. And um, it became rather discouraging for me that we would go into these new construction sites and we would talk to the builder, or in some cases with the homeowner, but in a lot of cases we're there before the homeowners had come in to the picture. And like this soil is hard as rock, you know, we should do something with this. And we would usually include soil site prep as a line item in our quotes. And that would be one of the first things that would be trimmed out of a landscape budget of like, we're just gonna throw sod on it and an irrigation system and they can take care of that later. And you can't really do much to take care of pretty serious compaction later. So just doing enough of those, like this isn't right, this doesn't feel right. And so eventually I, I bailed on that um, and then went back to South Dakota. And there I worked for a, a company, uh, it was an engineering company that did natural resources management. So then we got more into doing like a holistic approach or trying to um, uh, improve soil conditions and stuff or in promoting that. <clears throat> I moved back to the Twin Cities, worked, got a job with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts and worked there for about 10 years uh, doing urban um, restoration work. So trying to provide people with information on how to improve soils, select proper plants, you know, do things to reduce runoff, reduce erosion, um, things like that. And then now six years ago, I had uh, started at the city of Egan. So there, I, it, very nice, because then I was in a seven county area before, and now I'm just in one city. So a uh, much easier job for me. But I work there to provide technical support to reduce stormwater runoff impacts on priority lakes uh, through land projects and watershed stewardship activities. So in, in Egan, they have uh, 32 lakes and then uh, 1,200 other water bodies. I mean, it's, there's so many water resources in that city, and they have no streams. But very fascinating, but I also, I've, I've lived in Bloomington a long time, and I've been here for a long time because my, my grandparents' family are all from here, and so uh, I've just, I, water resources in Bloomington have always been very precious to me. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, seven county metropolitan area, this is a map of the pre-European pre -European settlement native plant communities. So types of plants are communities of plants, hundreds, thousands of different species of plants all coexisting together because of soil conditions, moisture conditions, um, sunlight conditions. But Hennepin, or, uh, Hennepin County here, Bloomington right here. So this color was sort of oak savanna, so prairie with scattered oak trees like bur oaks. The cream color, that's sort of like where the airport, uh, Mall of America area. Uh, that was true prairie, so no trees there. It was just, you know, shorter or sort of mixed height prairie species. And then as well down in Dakota County, um, some areas along the river. But the green color, <coughs> excuse me, that was the maple basswood forest areas. So that was actual forested, you know, uh, by 1850. Or around 1850 is when these surveys started of vegetation surveys or public land survey stuff. Uh, so this is what was here before we were here. So within a native prairie or an oak savanna, so what would have existed here in Bloomington, a lot of plant species that had just adapted to rain, um, periods of abundance, periods of drought. Uh, so they, a lot of them just developed really deep root systems to go through the soil and get moisture further down 
Um, so in this case, we have a plant that is about two, uh, two feet tall called lead plant. And that, there's still some of this, some remnant pieces of this down uh, on a bluff on Nine Mile Creek uh, in one very specific spot. Uh, two foot tall plant, but it's got a 15 foot deep root system. So we go into a little period of drought, it doesn't know it at all. You know, it's not affected by if we don't get rain for two weeks or three weeks. Uh, and a lot of these other plants, you know, too. As compared to Kentucky bluegrass, which is a European introduction, Kentucky bluegrass developed in an area uh, in Europe that gets four times as much annual rainfall as we get in Minnesota. So here it's under drought stress all the time, except right after a rain event or with irrigation. You know, you put it on irrigation to keep it alive. It can't develop a deep root system, it never had to do that, and so it takes a long time for plants to really adapt. Um, it's got a weak energy you know, root system that it just can't physically push into hard soils. So its root system is two to three inches max. Uh, so we go into a little bit of drought and it gets affected pretty easily. Uh, so um, this is just a little map of Bloomington. This is what remains of what are classified as areas of ecological significance. So areas that don't have a lot of invasive species in them or still have quite a few native uh, plants in them, both trees or just ground layer. And one area in particular, if you haven't checked it out. So, you know, Nine Mile Creek is in there, but there's a lot of buckthorn and stuff that's coming in around the edge that the city is doing uh, buckthorn removal projects and stuff in there. But this area is just a favorite of mine, uh, Tierney's Woods. Have you guys ever been out, walked in Tierney's Woods? It's, uh, it's out by that, uh, um, the, I forget the name of the, it's like senior living uh, place. It's where they, this road used to go across 169, but now it's sort of blocked off. But there's a really cool woodland area in there with little walk path you know, through it. It's really cool. Really cool in the spring and in the, in the summer and then very pretty in the fall. It's got these huge paper birch in there that are just gigantic, but uh, a lot of beautiful oaks, but very cool area in there. But there's still some pieces around, but a lot of the city, it's just had been developed. We might have some, na or some woodlands, but in a lot of cases, it's just a buckthorn forest. You know, we've got some oak trees that exist um, still, but they're not able to regenerate because the buckthorn is just so thick in there, and then there's just not a lot left of the ground layer. So this is what remains in the Twin Cities area of these native plant communities, these groups of plants. You know, that shows up a little bit in Bloomington, but there's not a lot left. So you have vegetation removal leads to decreased habitat, soil disturbance, leads to soil compaction, increased runoff, increased erosion, and then decreased water quality in lake streams and wetlands because you just have more water that's now flowing off, can't soak into the ground, and washing soil into water bodies. So this is when I was in the landscape contracting company, a lot of what, when we would show up at a site, this is what we had to deal with. So it'd be just super compacted out here from all the construction equipment, and then we would just put an irrigation system, lay sod on top of it, for the plantings, we would use a big auger on the front of the skid loader to bore the holes because you couldn't physically dig into the soil with a shovel. You know, just so compacted. Make it green and then turn it over to a homeowner and then this is what they, you know, have. And we would turn it on the irrigation systems when we'd install those, set it on um, new sod cycle, which is like watering at least every other day or sometimes every day. And sometimes we'd go back to a project a couple years later and it was still set on that cycle, you know. People are just dumping a ton of water uh, on to keep things alive. And you know, construction impacts, this is just hard as rock. And um, plants cannot, roots cannot grow down through that stuff. So when you put turf on it, we call that green concrete. You know, that it just, it's green at the surface, but it can't absorb any water down deep. It just saturates with irrigation and then everything else is just shedding off. Um, Every home is a big impact on stormwater runoff. Typical quarter, or, uh, third acre residential lot, <coughs> rooftop, lawn, driveway. In a one inch rainfall, there's about 7,000 gallons of water that comes off of a typical lot. So 1,700 gallons off of a typical rooftop, 1,100 gallons off a typical driveway, and about 4,500 gallons off of a typical compacted lawn. That's all coming off. You know, a lot of it at the front half is coming out here to the street and into the storm drain system in the back. Then it just sort of goes, you know, away into the neighbors or into these sometimes drainage swales. Over the course of the year, that's 220,000 gallons of water that's just annually coming off of the yard. Um, so rainwater absorbing landscapes are one way to take advantage of that water. 
So in this case, this was a house uh, we worked on in, in Plymouth um, when I was at the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, this was the rooftop drainage area that comes out of this downspout. So in a one inch rain event, there's 300 gallons of water that comes out of just this chunk right here. So their lawn's super compacted, you couldn't poke anything into it. Uh, water flow would go across the lawn when the lawn was saturated in a rainfall and then it just headed out to the street, spilled over the curb and into the gutter. At the same time, so and I was responsible for a lot of this when I was doing residential landscaping, we would put river birch trees by people's homes because we liked the way it looked with the brick. You know, something of, oh, that's pretty color. River birch tree, are, they're called river birch because they grow in river valleys and river flood plains. They're around moisture all the time. So you put it in this environment where up here it was like in a desert because the water that's coming off of the roof is coming out, going across this compacted lawn and out to the street. This thing is just suffering. And so in a lot of cases you have plants that are under stress that opens them up to more disease, you know, and insects, they can just sense it and they attack it. Um, so the river birch tree was not doing very well, hadn't grown much since it had been planted um, some years earlier. And then the shrubs are just sort of hanging on. Uh, but what we wanted to do is soak water in here. This was, at this point, was 15 feet away from the foundation. Anytime you're gonna soak water in, you wanna be at least 10 feet away from a foundation, you know, downhill. I want to try to go uphill. You don't want that water coming back into the basement or causing issues. If you're on slab, then it's, a, then it's different. You can go a little bit closer, but we don't want to cause <coughs> any basement water issues with this. So at least 10 feet away, if you've had basement water issues in the past in a specific corner, then I'd go a little further away or really find out what is the cause of that. But anyway, in, in this case, we were safe. We could soak water in out here. So here's the homeowner is digging a rain garden. So it's a depressed area. They're over digging it initially, digging out the soil that was to really loosen it up. The soil that they were digging out, they're putting on the downhill side to sort of make a berm or a hump. Um, so then water would come in here, fill, and then it would spill back out. This is the low point over here where the, down, where the runoff always used to go. So once this is full, it would spill this way. But this was, they were over loosening or over digging it and then this is after they had backfilled it in with compost. So now the above ground ponding was just about three or four inches deep. It wasn't very deep, but it had been loosened up about 18 inches below there to make this big sponge. Um, so this is on clay soils in Plymouth. I mean, they've got a lot of heavy soils, but this thing still, it drains down in six hours, you know, the water that's at the surface of it. But there they're mul they had put the compost in, they had mulched it, and now they were planting it. So you put the right plants in the right place. So in the bottom of the rain garden, you put plants that can tolerate a little periodic flooding. So these are native irises, blue flag irises, that really like those kinds of conditions. And they can take periodic drought if they're in good you know, uh, organic rich soils. And then on the berm area, they're putting uh, pussy toes. It's a low ground cover that just um, creates a carpet. And that plant likes berm conditions or likes drier soil conditions and does well. And this was it uh, two years later. <coughs> Excuse me. This cost 96 bucks for the whole thing. Um, they bought plugs, bought small native plants. They're pretty uh, inexpensive. And then the compost they got from the city of Plymouth. Uh, um, Bloomington doesn't, to my knowledge, doesn't have a, um, a free compost source, but there is across the river there's a place called the mulch store that's by the landfill that has really inexpensive weed seed free compost that's been heated to 155 degrees. And it's, it's like $14 for a cubic yard, which is a, would fill a pickup. I mean, it's pretty cheap stuff. Uh, and then shredded wood mulch. Uh, what they did, the homeowners, they wanted the colored mulch, but it would be expensive to do colored mulch for the whole thing. Um, and the colored part only lasts you know, for a little while until that stuff leaches off. But what we did was use the uh, cheaper, just regular shredded wood mulch on the bottom, and then they put the colored stuff on top just to top dress it. Then you can go really thin with that because mulch rots from the bottom up, so the stuff on top will stay there for a long time. But it was pretty uh, inexpensive. But then the river birch tree really kicked it in. You know, it was doing much better. The shrubs behind it much better because you're adding some moisture uh, next to them. This is a homeowner in, here in, um, 
in Bloomington uh, who does not live uh, just down the street. Their, uh, Nine Mile Creek is in their backyard, and 98th Street is just uh, to the left on this photo. But they, their driveway, their asphalt driveway that was before was shot. It was 35 years old. It was all busted up. It was time to redo something with the driveway. So the homeowner here was you know, concerned about water runoff, you know, wanted to do her part. And so she worked with a, an asphalt contractor called Earth Wizards that they also do rain gardens. They're sort of an environmental asphalt company, which is a weird you know, combination. But what they did, because the homeowner said, I want to reduce the runoff that goes down the driveway. So they tore out the old driveway, and they redid the base of the, of the driveway to tilt the whole thing. So the driveway tilts this way and runs into then an over-excavated rain garden over on this side. So they have very, they have this, this little part of the driveway right here actually leaves and goes out into the street. But otherwise, this catches, and then all this rooftop catches, comes out here and goes through a little dry stream bed. They have some low retaining walls in here that just sort of create temporary little pool areas. And then in a big rain event, it would just keep sort of spilling over and then out towards the street. But the first part of the rain events, it would be able to soak in, or most small rain events, less than an inch. But um, sort of a nifty little project. And this, she got, because it was in the Nine Mile Creek watershed, she got cost sharing money from the watershed district to put this in. That they really, the watershed district paid for this because then they sort of lumped this all together and then the watershed district said, we will pay for this part if you're paying for that part of the driveway. But the watershed district is it's a great, uh, they have their, their cost sharing program and they have a booth downstairs down at the very far end. Um, good people to talk to if you're in their watershed district. And they have maps to find out if you're in their watershed district. But, a lot of Bloomington is. Uh, for a healthy lawn, raising the mow height, the higher you mow, the deeper the roots can go on the grass, on the Kentucky bluegrass. If you're mowing it at an inch, it can only support a one inch deep root system. If you mow it at three inches, it can support a three inch deep root system if it can physically poke into the soil, if the soil is not too rock hard. Uh, mowing <coughs> high, so it reduces moisture loss, uh, it encourages deeper rooting, makes it more drought tolerant. Um, don't mow during droughts. What my practice has been for many years, and it works very well, but of, uh, you know, one, once we stop getting rain, so like in July, there's been as many years that I've, I haven't, we get to the beginning of July, and I don't mow until September. Because if we're not getting any rain, the grass is not really growing. It's not doing very well. And the more you mow it, like especially when we're not getting rains, the more you're stressing it out because you're making fresh cuts across the blades of grass. And any place there's fresh cuts, that's where water vapor is escaping out of the plant. So it just wilts down faster. Um, and also, I think on the next one, using a sharp uh, mulching blade. And I encourage people to have two mower blades so you can just make sure you've got one sharp one on hand and keep checking it before you mow. Just reach under and carefully slide your finger along the blade. But if there's any nicks in it, if there's any roundedness to it, that should come off and put, the, put a sharp blade on. Because with, with dull blades, so a sharp blade would cut the, cut the leaf blade cleanly, pretty cleanly. You use a dull blade and it rips it. And so you have all this jaggedness on the end of the leaf blades of the grass. That creates more surface area where it just loses water vapor, so it just wilts out faster. So the sharper it is, the better the cut will be. And then with the mulching blades, there's a lot of different styles, but um, bagging is sort of University of Minnesota Extension Service. You know, the turf grass people, they don't encourage bagging at all. You know, you, you chop up the leaf blades really finely, let it sit on the, on the, on the, back on the lawn. It breaks down really quickly. Um, by bagging, you're also removing nutrients, you know, off of what could be sort of free fertilizer, free organic matter. Uh, so letting it lay, but chopping it up really finely so there's not big chunks of grass. And oftentimes, too, dull blades, they just don't re-chop it very well um, compared to the sharper blades. So cleaner cut is less moisture loss. Testing for soil compaction. 
what we use on construction sites is it's called a soil penetrometer. This thing's about three feet long. Push it in the ground, it's got a little gauge. It tells you the level of compaction at different depths. What anyone can use is just a little wire flag, like this, utility locate flag. You want a nice straight one. And then you take it to your lawn. So once the soil is, is thawed out, so we get to you know end of April, maybe, um, depending on how this goes, maybe sooner. But you take the wire flag, you hold it nice and sturdy at the bottom of the flag, and start pushing it into your soil. And see how far down you can push that into the ground. If you can push it all the way into the ground, you don't have compaction issues. But if you can only get it in a couple of inches and it's just super hard and you can't push it in, move over a little bit and try again because you might be on a root or a rock or something. But keep trying it out and see if you can sink this all the way in. Usually if you've got a well-established tree in your yard, that the trees do a really good job of loosening soil compaction, but it takes many, many years. And usually you can sink this pretty easily around tree roots if you can get between the tree roots. But you go out in the areas away from the tree and usually then it usually get, gets more compacted. But something to check for, uh, an easy test for that, to determine if you need to aerate. If you can't push that thing in to three inches at least, uh, then that's when you should look at using a lawn aerator, a core plug aerator. So those can usually go down about three inches ideally. If the soil, you only want to do this when the soil's sort of moist. If the soil's dry, if we're in a drought, it's a waste of money to do this because then it, it physically can't penetrate down that far. It'll go down maybe an inch or so, um, but it won't pull out the, the full depth. And you really want those full, that full depth. And then the, the plugs drop on the lawn and they'll break down and then sort of go back in. Um, or loosened soil will go back in, but it creates pockets for water to be able to soak back in and oxygen. Um, get out, <coughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do if you've got compacted soils. If you can sink that flag again all the way in, you don't have to do this because then it's not dealing with the soil compaction issue. If you do it yourself, you want to pre-locate and flag any shallow buried wires, telephone cable can be sometimes pretty shallow, and irrigation heads. Those will, this thing will punch right through the top of an irrigation head. Um, Lawn service companies do it. I had a contractor do it, um, and it was 85 bucks. I think fall is the best time to do it. Equipment rental, you can get them usually for 65 bucks, but then you have to trailer it. You know, you pay another five or 10 bucks to move it, and if you got a hitch on your vehicle or you're borrowing, you know, I think it's pretty cost effective to have a contractor do it. If you're, if you're making sure they're in the you know, 85, 95 bucks is a pretty reasonable, in my opinion. Best time to do it is in September. Next best time is May to June. Uh, it's not as great here in May to June because you have more weed seeds, dandelions, stuff like that blowing around, that you could be introducing a lot of areas where then more weed seeds could blow in and germinate in these holes. In the fall, there's not as much of that going on. So there's your core plug um, aeration. Toro has this one, and this is on, what they use on bigger sites, um, <laughs> deep tine aeration. These things can go down eight to 16 inches in depth. I mean, way down in, they jab in and then sort of rock the soil. But this is what they use like on some golf courses and the rough areas where they're trying to loosen soils. Uh, soil sampling. Uh, so at, at work, we do soil sampling for, for residents if they want to find out what they've got down for their soils, we help them do soil tests and stuff or um, collect the soil to send it in for samples. But we use this auger that can go down 24 inches, but it's really, for main soil samples, you want to go zero to four inches and see what's, what's down there. This is a good sign. It's nice and black. It's got organic matter in it. This, if you've got this right below your surface, that's, not, that's saying you're too light on the organic matter. You need more compost, you know, something in there because there's no moisture holding capacity within this. There's no nutrients within, the, within that. But um, this is good. That's not. What this was, it's a little deceiving, but this hole also was initially black, but I just kept going down to see what was further down below the black. Because uh, the homeowner was convinced they had clay soils, but they had compacted soils at the very surface. Underneath there, they had very sandy soils. But it just had been driven over by equipment, so at the surface, it got smucked down. Um, Anyway, um, that's uh, taking soil samples are a very good thing. Sending that into the university, 
Have any of you sent in a soil sample before to the university to see? So it costs 17 bucks to send in a sample. This is the form, and I've got forms down at our booth. I forgot to bring the handouts um, <coughs> down at our booth at the um, south end of the building. You fill this out. You check over here, regular test. That includes organic, total organic matter, phosphorus, potassium, lime, or pH. Um, and then on the back side, it talks about how to gather the sample, where to mail the sample to, or where to drop it off at the university at the St. Paul lab. And then you get this sheet back. So here's your soil test report. And the number that I really look the most at is this organic matter percent. You want to be at 5% or more soil organic matter for a healthy soil. 5 to 10% is usually the healthy range for a, for a typical lawn. This one, 2.5%, that would tell me it needs to add in organic matter or add in compost. And I'll show you how, to, how that's done in a little bit. But really, again, the goal for organic matter is greater than 5%. And most suburban lawns don't, they don't hit it. You know, because when, when um, grading work is done, final grading work is done, and they bring in topsoil, it's junk stuff that comes from another site that has maybe some blackness colored to it but it, it could be you know, a lot of clay content. We don't need any more clay you know, added on on the surface, but um, we, did, we used horrible stuff to dump on people's lawns and drove over it, and it was full of weed seeds too, and blah, blah, blah. But um, compost, leaf, well-aged leaf compost, this is the stuff that you would get from like the mulch store or some of the other le you know, legitimate places that sell compost. So this, like I mentioned before, is weed seed free. So it ha it's been heated to 155 degrees and that kills off the weed seeds, pathogens, you know, that kind of stuff in there. And it's just leaves and grass clippings. It's very crumbly stuff. But that is the organic matter that the lawn needs. Um, this is one way to spread it. There's some contractors that have them, these big hoppers, they fill it in, it's a power spreader and just blast it across. And you're just really needing to hit an eighth inch to a quarter inch depth across the lawn. In the fall is a really good time to do that. And then it just, the lawn will be black, blackish a little bit, but then it, it breaks down and then goes in, incorporates in. Um, and, and doing that potentially um, every other year for a couple of years, or you, you do it once, wait a year, take another lawn sample, send it in and see if, how much that's changed your organic content. <coughs> There's other contractors, they pull up with a big semi, pull out a big hose, and then they can just blast it on. Um, but that, you're, you're paying more to have a contractor do that. Bless you. Uh, you know, one way to also do this, you get it in a pickup, or you have it delivered to the site, dumped in the driveway, you know, what have you, and then get a wheelbarrow, load up the wheelbarrow, go and dump piles around in the yard, and then get a hard tined rake, and then just rake it out. It's easy to spread, and it's super light stuff. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy to apply, and it's easy to haul in a pickup because it is so light. It's not going to you know, weigh down the truck. For, for larger projects, this is what should be done on, on new construction projects before the lawn is put down. Well, they're tilling, but it depends really on the type of tiller. If the tiller um, little spades are uh, curved back in at the bottom or on the outside of, their, of the till, sometimes they can smear and compact soil further down below where they've loosened. So this is a, a soil spade, it's called. These things just jam into the soil and they don't create a hard pan and just fracture the soil. This is what the DOT requires on their um, landscaping projects now. Uh, lawn alternatives, like I mentioned before, or maybe, if, I, know, I can't remember if I mentioned before, fine fescue lawn grass. Compared to Kentucky bluegrass that has a two to three inch deep root system, fine fescue lawn grass, once it's established, has about an eight to 10 inch deep root system. It's much more drought tolerant than Kentucky bluegrass. It comes from an area in Northern Europe that's more in line with what we get for annual precipitation here. So it just matches Minnesota better. Um, there's a diagram of its root system. <coughs> Excuse me. Yarrow also is a pretty nice lawn substitute in very sunny areas, really dry conditions, uh, and, and abused environments. Uh, out by the boulevard, in the boulevard area, behind the curb where you can't get grass to grow, this stuff works really well. It likes clay soils, compaction, doesn't seem to mind salts. Uh, so I grew up in South Dakota on a farm, and 
our house was in what used to be a pasture. And my mom did a lot of the mowing when my brother and I were very young. And she would drop the mower blade down. She wanted it to look like a golf course. And be, we had no irrigation system and we didn't fertilize or anything. But in July, she would scalp the lawn. You know, it'd be like an inch tall or an inch and a quarter. And the next day or two days later, it's not, it's not raining for a while or in a drought. Everything's brown except for this stuff. This would just be these green patches that could tolerate being mown short. And it would still flower too, because yarrow flowers has little pink flowers or white flowers on it. But it's super drought tolerant. And it was really, my brother and I played on it a lot, um, this barefoot. You could walk on that part of our lawn. The rest of our lawn was all dead. And so that was very painful to walk on because all this little sharp stubble. But this stuff's pretty uh, neat stuff. But you do have to mow it at least every couple of weeks because if you don't mow it, it's going to go to 18 to 24 inches tall and not you know, a great low lawn. The fine fescues, I should have mentioned, so some sell it as what's called a no-mow lawn mix. Um, if you don't mow it, it's going to get six inches, seven inches tall. But you can mow it a couple of times per year to keep it at three inches or four inches. Um, I had it. I seeded it out at a, um, a place that I, was, I lived at for eight years. And I seeded it the first year I was in there on a berm. I had put in a rain garden. Then we had a berm on the downhill side of the rain garden. And I did fine fescue um, to just try that out. And this was like 2001. And um, I lived there for eight years. I mowed that area six times over the eight years because then sometimes it depended on how much rain we got at the end of June. If we got a lot of rain in mid to end of June, then the stuff would get a little bit taller, you know, five inches, and I would mow it, and then at three inches, and then that was it for the summer. I mean, I didn't have to mow it again, and it would stay very green. Um, but if you want to maintain a, you know, sort of a manicured yard look, but still mowing no less than three inches, you might have to do end of June, beginning of September, you know, maybe. But it's nice stuff. What it doesn't do well with is if you've got a low spot in your yard that then it's underwater right now, you know, or underwater during a rain event, it floods, that will kill it. If you have an area in your yard that kids are constantly like running over, or you have a dog that's constantly running a path through, this won't be able to tolerate that either. But neither will, you know, Kentucky bluegrass has trouble with that too. But <coughs> I do have a, the, a handout that I forgot to bring that is down at our booth, again at the south end of the building, that then has a source for this. And, uh, prairienursery.com is one source that we've found that has a really good mix. So it's got five to six different species of fine fescues. They've been selling it since the mid-90s. They've really honed it down. Uh, you can find this now. It's becoming more popular at the, at the retail level. But if you go to one of the regular big box stores, they're not getting a northern you know, Minnesota or, or a northern United States appropriate mix. Um, I would just, um, that, that other one I've had a lot of good luck with. Clover lawn, I've never, I've not personally done this. I tried a, a trial sample of it and, and just in a, in a flat or in a little tray, and I wasn't having good success, um, but I'd like to see some experiment with that. But some people just have such a negative reaction with clovers that uh, it could not, just wouldn't be a, a, a um, choice that they would go for. Um, other free outdoor water saving tips, avoid mowing during droughts, like I mentioned, because you can lose water, uh, lose moisture to water vapor or vapor going into the atmosphere. Keep the mowing blades sharp and loosen compacted soils. For irrigation systems, don't water the road. You know, an automatic irrigation system, it makes me very sad to see watering of the road because this water is from deep aquifers, you know, 400 to 1,000 feet below the surface. It's treated drinking water and then just getting uh, wasted. So very easy to adjust those heads to prevent watering the road. Don't water in the rain. If you see an irrigation system going off in the, in the rain, uh, very sad, a, a $16 to $50 um, unit to stop the irrigation system from watering when it's raining. But these will then, say it rains in the morning and the irrigation system's scheduled to go off in the afternoon. Rains in the morning, we get an inch, sun comes out, dries the tip of this thing off, by the afternoon, it's saying, we're ready to go. Let's water. So what uh, Toro now sells is called a uh, soil moisture, um, our precision soil monitoring system. It's got six inch long probes that push into the ground 
and then this sensor or this receiver gets attached to the irrigation timing box, if the soil stays moist here, it will override the system. And so this is a better system than those rain sensors. Um, but those have just sort of come on the market in the last you know, four or five years for the residential scale. Uh, drip irrigation system, if you're going to be watering plants, you know, not your lawn, but shrub beds, perennial beds, drip irrigation is way better than any overhead spray because uh, that can lead to fungus issues. This puts the water right on the soil where it needs it. Watching the rain gauge, seeing how much rain we've actually received. It was a couple of years ago when we had the super wet May and June, we would get an inch and a quarter, and then I had a neighbor that the next day he'd be watering his lawn, and I'm like, we just got an inch of rain. Oh, didn't, he didn't have a rain gauge, didn't really think how much did we get, but then he's starting to dump on more water again. We don't, uh, we don't need it, so getting a, a rain gauge is a good idea to just keep track of how much you're actually getting in your location. Because typically, on average, so a lawn needs, a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, one inch of water per week uh, to stay um, alive <coughs> or growing, excuse me. And on average, we're getting that in May, June, July, and August, on average. We might have some you know, periods of, of uh, dry, but then just don't mow at those um, times. Avoid watering between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. when it gets really warm. That's when you can lose, and you're irrigating in the hot of the day, you're losing 50% of that water to vapor. It's just going away right away. So it's just a waste of uh, groundwater, of treated drinking water. Avoid watering on windy days, because then that's more, it can go to vapor or just blow off target. Avoid overwatering, because that can cause shallow roots, because the, the grass will just adapt to, I don't have to go down to search for any moisture, I can stay really shallow. It also leads to stress and diseases if it's just watered too much and uh, maintain that rain gauge, keep an eye on that. Rainwater harvesting, there's a lot of opportunities to harvest water off the rooftop to reuse for landscape watering. So again, you know, in a one inch rain event, there's 1,700 gallons of water coming off of a typical rooftop. You look at, your, at the individual like downspout areas and there's a lot of volume coming off. So this typical front corner of a house, 555 gallons coming off. Um, so this is a rain barrel at, at uh, my house. I have so my downspout here, I put in, it's called a downspout diverter. So it takes the first part, or, or takes rain, and in through this little hose, fills the rain barrel. Once the rain barrel's full, it won't let any more water go into that hose, and then everything else goes past it. It's got a little leaf filter inside of it, so then leaves and other junk doesn't get in there, but a slick little outfit. Um, but Here's where the water comes in. So the critical components, the inlet, how the water gets in, the overflow, how the water gets out when it's full. This with the diverters, then when the barrel's full, it's just taking everything past it, you know, down the downspout, rather than if you hook the downspout right into the top of the rain barrel and you have 500 gallons of water coming out in a one inch rain event out of one corner of the house, this is 50 gallons. It's gonna fill up really fast. And then how's that water get out? Sometimes they'll just have a little hose like a garden hose overflow on the side, that will be too small to move out that volume of water. So you could cause water issues. In this case, it's right by my little half basement area. I don't want any water problems by that. So this is my, this diverter is my insurance policy that this is not gonna be spilling over um, right by my house. Uh, your primary outlet, so down here, I've got a little valve that then is hooked to a uh, soaker hose so that I just weave around my landscape plants. When I want to water, I flip this valve, I walk away, I come back 30 minutes later, it's drained it down, I shut off the valve, and it's empty, ready for a next rainfall. Uh, and then your storage. So this is one type. I got this as a Father's Day present. Uh, this was from Menards. It was on sale around Father's Day. They always have good rain barrel sales that they're usually like, you know, at least 25% off. Uh, but this, I think my um, wife got it for 55 bucks something like that. And it's a pretty nice one. It's got a flat back so it can tuck right up against the house tight. And then there's a little stand. This was a separate, but this is another like 15 bucks that just lifts it up, gives it a little bit more head um, pressure. There it is here, sort of tucked back behind a shrub. It just sort of blends in, I think. Um, you can, so there's the diverter. This one's got a little plastic cover on it. You pop that off and then uh, check every once in a while on the little leaf filter to see if that's getting plugged up. I've got a big silver maple tree. 
a female that dumps a lot of seeds and stuff that gets in to the system. So occasionally during the, that seed drop that I have to go in and flower drop, pop out that, dump it, I, but it's like 10 seconds of maintenance. Another type of diverter, this is a homeowner that had five rain barrels back here, painted them the color of his house because he didn't want his neighbor to like go, oh, those are an eyesore. He just wanted it to blend in, put it behind a row of shrubs that he already had going on here. But here he's got 250 gallons of storage connected to one valve, turns it on, and then he uses that to water a garden. Um, these are tanks that then lay flat, 250 gallons of capacity here underneath this deck which is sort of a cool idea. It just has one valve over on the side. You open it up, waters the plants, shut it off when it's empty, ready to go, and you don't see anything. Uh, this is just a cool one I thought of a Target store. This is in Michigan. They put in a 30,000 gallon cistern right next to the store. It takes all the rooftop runoff, and then they use that for irrigation outside, but then also for flushing toilets and stuff inside, any non-drinking water use. That was it during construction. And then they, um, added stone facing on the whole thing too to make it look very nice. But at the Maplewood Mall, they just added one of these in the last, maybe three years ago now. They got a big cistern um, out by that store. But for water harvesting tips or using rain barrels, I recommend placing the rain barrel close to the area where you're gonna use the water. You know, Try to get a, avoid um, having to fill up the rain barrel with watering cans and taking that someplace as much as you can because uh, then you're just, it's going to be a lot of work than doing that of, because you're filling up a gallon watering can. It's got 50 gallons in it. It's a lot of trips. I just like putting it at some place where I know I can have a, I, I have a need to put a soaker hose in or something. Um, you want to keep it uphill of areas to be watered. Keep inlets cleared and secured. That, my rain barrel and all the rain barrels now that are promoted, are, they're sealed up or they don't have a physical way for mosquitoes to get into them. So you want, don't want it to become a mosquito issue. If you have an open top rain barrel, that's prime mosquito habitat. Um, so keep them sealed up. They've got tight screens over them or just sealed drums with the diverters. Keep some mosquitoes out and winterize appropriately. And so for mine to winterize it, I disconnect a little hose that goes in there and put then the, the diverter kit comes with a little plug and you put that over the hose and then that's it. You don't have to take the rain barrel inside. You don't have to turn the rain barrel upside down. You know, none of that stuff with the diverter kits. So again, those tips, build healthy soil, use water wisely, select proper plants. Backyard wildlife habitat. Planting to attract caterpillars. Monarch caterpillars need our help. They need more milkweed family plants out there to eat on, to go from caterpillars to butterflies. So highly encourage planting. There's butterfly milkweed, there's uh, marsh milkweed, uh, common milkweed. There are plants that then are uh, useful to them for, for food source, um, both milkweeds during um, their butterfly stage, but then also this is a type of blazing star and a whole bunch of other plants that are good for the monarchs. But th then there's a lot of other butterflies too that we should be feeding. Um, share your yard with wildlife. You know, I highly recommend rather than trying to work on just an eradication program. Um, chipmunks, I have ones that they live under my steps, you know, but I could, they, they're just looking for a protected little place to burrow into and have their little nest, their little cavity. Um, pile of rocks, that's what some people do, a pile of rocks out away from the house, they're gonna head to that. You know, that'd be their preference anyway. But um, just sort of work with them on that. That is it, there's good plant catalogs out there. I've got these at our little display. Again, it's down at the south end of the building that I've got handouts. And there's also, let's see, our email or our website address that has more information is bushlakeikes.org and that's also on the handout downstairs. So afterwards or after when you get a chance, if you want to mosey on down to that south end, I'd love to talk with you further. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.